sharing my screen. I think this is how it works. Let's see. Or now what? Yeah, so I presume I'm audible for everyone. Yeah, yeah, perfect. OK, so yeah, welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my final presentation of my internship, which is about efficient common smoothing in linear state space models using Gaussian message passing which is uh, quite a mouthful, but I hope things will become clear in uh, this presentation. So what we'll be talking about today. So first of all, I will give a brief description of the project. So what was the goal of this internship? And uh, yeah, so what was uh, and under what models and what things we will be discussing. So after that, as the title suggests, it's about common smoothing. And for this, we dove into the literature and found three smoothers. And we will first explain a bit the theory and the weaknesses and strengths of these three smoothers. And after that, we will show how we, that we implemented them and we did some experiments to compare them and see if the theory is indeed complies with, uh, with real life, which sometimes is not true, but uh, in this case it was. But for that, we did some experiments. And after that, we had some, some time left. So we started looking into, yeah, how is common smoothing done in reactive MP with the current approach? And then we saw how that worked and we thought, OK, yeah, well, maybe one of our three smoothies can also be uh, a nice addition. So there we also will be talking about the proposed approach and then compare the two to see uh, how this proposed approach works in reactive MP. And then we will end with a with a wrap up of the of the presentation. So let's first talk about yeah, the project description. So yeah, as some of you may may know or have heard of, there is this toolbox called Forney Lab or Reactive MP. I presume uh, many of you have worked with it. It's uh, yeah, basically automated message passing. So it's cool. You define a model and then some random variables, and then it basically automates the the inference or the free energy minimization. And of course, there's a way now in Reactive MP how you perform common smoothing. But over the years, like different message passing based smoothers have also been proposed, for example, by Lilliger et al. in 2007, 2016, and also in the thesis of Wadeen in 2019. And so uh, Bert found these papers and he said, OK, yeah, well, maybe it's a good idea to see if we can add these to our, to our, to our toolbox because they claim to be superior in certain scenarios. So then the question arose, is it worth implementing these alternative smoothness in reactive MP as well? And like, uh, is it easy or difficult? And what are their advantages, but also perhaps some disadvantages? So yeah, that was kind of my assignment to find out. And yeah, so in this presentation, I will give you uh, hopefully the answers to that. So yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's find out. So first of all, a brief introduction of what we have been investigating mostly is this, yes, as the title is common smoothing. So really a quick uh, overview of what common smoothing is, is uh, you have uh, some observed signal, which in this scenario is like two dimensional over 50 time steps. And that is generated by some two dimensional hidden signal, but we do not observe this one. So based on this two dimensional observed signal, we want to infer the smoothed uh, signal. So that's what you see here at the bottom. And for this, we can use the full horizon of our, of our observed signals. So we basically want to get this red line here and this green line as well for the both dimensions. And so yeah, that's basically what common smoothing is, is to infer the marginals of the, of the hidden states given your full uh, observed signal. And uh, yeah, so what model we will be discussing here, so we have to investigate this as such as in linear state space models, but to give keep notation clear for everyone, so almost on the same page. Here, here we have it. So we have this hidden state here, and the next time step is determined by putting this hidden previous hidden state through a matrix A, and then we add some random input, which is uh, Gaussian, through a matrix B, and then we add that to it. And then the uh, signal that we observe here is the hidden state here, put through a matrix C, and then we added some, some output noise. So this is the graphical representation and more the mathematical notation is here on the left is here CK is A times the previous plus B times your input. And then your output is C times your hidden state plus some plus some noise. And uh, three important parameters here, which turn out to be uh, yeah, very important for the efficiency or the complexity of these smoothers. 
are the values here. You see here n, which is the dimensionality of your hidden state, m, which is the dimensionality of your inputs, and v, which is the dimensionality of your outputs. And of course, these three values need not be the same. So you can, for example, have a 20 dimensional hidden state, but only a one dimensional input and a one dimensional output. And as it turns out, is that these three parameters, they determine quite heavily the, what the running time or the complexity of your, of your smoothness will be. So these three values are important for our, for our analysis and experiments. That's why I thought it would be good to, to mention. So yeah, that's basically the project description in a nutshell. So we're now we're interested in the, those Kalman smoothers. So uh, let's take a look at them. We will first quickly look at the theory and what are the pros and cons of it. So these three smoothers are the smoothers that uh, were, were mentioned. The first one is then the Rauchtung's triple smoother. The second is the modified price and facial smoother. And last but not least, we also have the backward information filter forward marginal smoother but we will stick to their uh, abbreviations to make things uh, easier. So RTS, MBF, and BIFM. And also a key thing that I would like to uh, emphasize is that all three smoothers produce the exact same outcome. So they all produce the same results. But uh, the, the very interesting part is that different parameterizations and different ways you do the messages result in different uh, computations and also in different running times. So they all three produce the same result, but the way they get to it takes a different uh, running time. But that I thought would be good to mention as well. So let's first take a look at the uh, RTS, which is the, the most basic one. So here we have like a visual picture where we have like the A, B and C matrix here inside this RTS node, just to keep things clear and show how the messages go from time step to time step. So in the forward pass here, we just basically do a forward Kalman filter which is basically a parameterization with a mean and a regular covariance. And in the backwards uh, pass, we basically do the same. So we first do a full forward pass and then also a backward pass so that we get a forward message and a backwards message with a proportional to a normal distribution. And then if we want to perform the smoothing parts, we compute the marginals. And as you may know, like by the sub product algorithm, this marginal is proportional to the product of the incoming and the outgoing message. And here then we see some disadvantages of RTS. So this is like the most basic one or the most standard is that this marginalization here requires you to invert a covariance matrix. And this is proportional to this N, the dimensionality of your hidden state. And also for the forward column field, you are required to invert a matrix which is proportional to your output. But it has, of course, some advantages because else I wouldn't also be mentioning this is that it's easily extendable because you have some for you have your me messages in a normal mean covariance parameterization. So if you say you want to get uh, add some extra uh, random variables or put something on top of the input, then it's quite easily done. You can easily extend on this. So that's the first one. And so now let's look at the MBF, which is the first one that Lilliger and Wadeen proposed. So the forward pass is the same as RTS, which kind of uh, already guesses that the, out, the, the backwards pass is different. So the, the interesting part about MBF is that in the backwards pass, they use this uh, yeah, quite confusing uh, and common uh, parameterization. So they call this like the dual precision and the dual precision weighted mean. And you can already see like it has the forward and the backwards message. So it's sort of a, it's, you can see this sort of a, the marginals of set, but under some uncommon parameterization. And what is cool about um, MBF is that it is, uh, as I can show you in the plot here, it's capable of producing the marginals immediately in the second pass, so in the forward pass of your, uh, of your smoother. So what it does is, is if it has the previous marginal, or here the marginal from ZK, and the forward uh, message from ZK minus one, then MBF has enough information to compute the marginal from ZK minus one here. And then when we want to marginalize along this edge, we basically just only pick the marginal message. So this might be a bit fast, but what I mean is that if you just start with an uninformative marginal all the way at the end, you can compute your marginal for ZN, 
and then iteratively compute also your margin for Zn minus 2, Zn minus 3, all the way to the beginning. And so you can compute your marginal like iteratively in your uh, forward, uh, in your backwards pass along as you go. And so then your marginal here will just be uh, marginal with this uncommon parameterization, which is then proportional to your marginal message, which is the message that you computed in your backwards pass. And the interesting part about MBF is that it can easily be rewritten just to your regular uh, mean covariance parameterization. And this rewriting does not require you to invert this n times n matrix. So here we can already see the gain of MBF and why Lilliger said this is a good, this can be a good choice because you lose this, this inverse at every time step, which can already be a, a significant gain. And so some other properties which I found uh, cool and interesting to mention, which shows the weaknesses and strengths of MBF. So the cool thing is that messages to the plus node go quite easily. So here you can see the update rules of MBF. And here in the forward pass, we see that uh, the messages go, go through them quite easily. So here we see, we want to compute the messages that go to the plus node. We only need to add the parameters of the incoming edges here. And for the backwards pass, it's even easier because there the messages are like invariant through the plus node, which is also why I presume they picked this uncommon parameterization because these, uh, with MBF, the messages basically just shoot through all the plus nodes, which makes a uh, inference very fast. However, it's also a downside is that messages to the equality node here are difficult. And the reason for that is that with the regular common filter in the forward pass, you have to infer the matrix which is proportional to your outputs. So that are kind of the pros and cons of MBF, but I thought it would be good to mention as well. So lastly, we also have then the BIFM. And as the name suggests, we start with a backwards information filter. So we go from the end to the beginning. And then we have this, uh, but under this information filter parameterization with a precision weighted mean and a precision. And that's like the first thing that we do, we do this backwards pass. And then in a forward pass, as the name suggests, we have this forward marginal. So just like MBF in the second pass, which now is a forward pass, we can iteratively immediately compute the marginals. And how that works is that if you have the previous marginal message here and your backwards message from ZK, then you have all the information you need to compute the marginal for ZK here. And the cool thing there is that if we want to marginalize this, is then we just simply again pick only the, the marginal message. And so you can see that if you would start at the beginning with some marginal uh, uninformed prior, then you can compute your marginal for C1, your marginal for C2, et cetera, until you have basically done all the smoothing. And so this is then how it would look like in it with the marginals. But now we can see that these marginals are already in a correct parameterization, which is kind of a, an advantage of BIFM over MBF, which are proportional to the, to the marginal message. And so, yeah, lastly, there are some pros and cons again. So what I find also cool here is that you can see that now like the equality node and the plus node are switched with MBF and BIFM. So in the beginning, the equality node was difficult, but now we see that the equality node is easy. So in the backwards pass here, we see that it's just an addition of the, of the parameters here. And in the forwards pass, they are invariant through the equality node. So now you have that with BIFM, the messages uh, require barely any computation when you go through equality nodes. However, now you can see, okay, you cannot see, but it turns out that the plus nodes here are now the, the bottleneck. So when you go through the plus nodes, you are fortunately required to infer the matrix proportional to your input. But that's also the cool part. Now it's proportional to the input, whereas with MBF it's proportional to the output. So yeah, the last bit of theory, I, I promise. So here we have shown like the complexity and also the required inverses per time step. And now we can really see also the differences. Although they produce the same results, they have different complexities. So here we see that RTS and MBF are cubic with respect to D and also invert the D times D matrix because of their forward Kalman filter. And MBF here is cubic with respect to your M, your inputs, and also requires the invert input matrix because of the information filter or the precision, precision weighted mean parameterization. 
So we see different complexities here. So from this, we can like, hypothesize that the running times of RTS and MBF will scale poorly with B, because there's a cubic here, but well with M, because there's no M here. And then the converse will be true, will most likely be true for PIFM. And then lastly, we also expect that all three smoothers will scale quite poorly with N, which is unfortunate, but that's how it goes when you do common smoothing, because you have to do some matrix matrix multiplications, which are proportional to your hidden state. And we presume that it's cubic uh, in programming languages. But we expect RTS here to be the worst because you also have this inverse when you marginalize at every time step, which you do not have with MBF and BIFM. So like that's the last part of the of the theory. So yeah, we have now looked at like the things from a theoretical perspective and we kind of now see like what are the pros and cons, but we are not sure if that's also the, the case in, in real life. So for that, we have implemented them and also spent quite some time on speeding things up, reducing the number of allocations to only a couple. So that was also quite fun to work on. But now we will be see if the theory indeed complies with, re with reality. So for that, what we, what we did is we wanted to see how the running time increased of the three smoothest as a function of these D, M and N. And how we did it is that we uh, fixed like uh, two parameters, like we fix our input and our state. And then we pick a value for our output, for example, uh, three. And then we generate 250 time steps. And then we run all three smoothers on it and then compare the running time of these three smoothers. And then we plotted the running times as a function of uh, these three parameters separately. So I think a plot will make this uh, more clear. So here we have plotted the running times of the three smoothers against uh, the output dimension. So how we did is we fixed our input dimension and our state dimension to three. And then for each instance of our, of our D, we basically generated 250 time steps. We run all three smoothers on it and did that a couple of times to get the confidence results. And then now we see here what the, what the median running times was of all the experiments as a function of your D here. And now we indeed see that our theory complies with the practice here at least. So it's interesting to see that all three smoothers produce the same results, but they take a very different time on it. So the BIFM here is, a proportion, is a, just a straight line. It does not care about how big your output is, but it still produces the same results here at DS40 as here your RTS and MBF, whereas they take uh, almost 50 times as long. So that's very interesting to see how a different parameterization can yield vastly different running times. So we see your RTS and MBF you scale quite, quite badly, and also here. And here we see just a, a massive jump. And the explanation for this massive jump is because of the inverse that is required with respect to T. And yeah, that's a, queer, a quirk of Julia that until the 16th dimension, it's quite okay. But from the 17th dimension onward, suddenly the time required to invert the matrix increases almost fivefold, which is very strange and unfortunate, but something we will have to deal with. But yeah, it's cool to see that the theory complies to the practice here it for the output dimension and for the input dimension we can see it basically the other way around so now rts and mbf are like straight lines because they uh, require barely any computations with respect to m but bifm requires this inverse so here we see that bifm increases quite heavily and lastly we also checked for the state dimensions and here we see that all three uh, scale quite poorly but this was also what we expected and here also we can see that RTS requires this inverse here. And then we see also that it is it's quite a lot slower than the other two. So here indeed Lilliger and Wade made a, made a compelling case to say, yeah, we see that uh, PIFM and MBF really benefits from not inverting this matrix when marginalizing. So to recap for the theoretical hypothesis, we indeed saw that RTS and MBF scaled poorly with D because we saw them increase. But for M, they were just like straight lines. And for BIFM, it was like the opposite was true. It was a straight line for D, but for M, it increased. And yeah, for N, the hidden state dimension, all smooth is like increased. But for RTS, we saw because the inverse, it also had that spike and then it continued. 
So that was basically the first part of the internship. We now have like a feeling over three smoothers. What are their weaknesses, their strengths? But we had some time left and we saw, OK, so let's now see how common smoothing has done in Reactive MP. So and see if we can improve on that. So for that, we first implemented like the common smoother just in the regular way as you would do in Reactive MP. So here you see a quick code snippet and the model again on the right here. So we first define a prior, then sample this U from a Gaussian, and then this set we multiply by A, and then we add B times this input, and then our X here is C times this hidden state plus some noise, and then we set the previous set to be, so, so we shift then the set once time step so that we can go to the next, uh, next time step here. So that's how the model looks. And now we were really also interested to see like, okay, how long does this take with reactive MP? And here we plotted uh, the hidden state. And here we see that it's beginning quite okay. But here we see again this, this quite big spike here, or spike uh, jump up. And the reason for that is because of the marginalization that you require this inverse. But we see already for like the mid to quite large hidden state dimension that it almost takes a, a full second here which is quite, uh, quite, quite a long running time for 250 samples. And yeah, so whereas the, uh, the experiments that we did at the beginning only remained like a couple of hundred milliseconds. So from this we said, okay, so we see there are some gains to be made in reactive MP. So perhaps we can try to implement such one of, one of these smoothers. So like that's the next one. So one that we propose one of those new smoothers. So what we propose to, to do is just implement a BIFM node. So we pick BIFM because it's it's faster. So because you don't have this inverse with the marginalization, and you already have the uh, margins in the correct parameterization, and it works very well when your input is low dimensional, and a low dimensional input is not a very unrealistic assumption in state-based models. So for example, you can have a one-dimensional or a couple-dimensional signal for to correct some things. So we thought BIFM made a compelling case to be a competitor for the reactive MP implementation. So what we did is uh, we created a BIFM node in reactive MP, where we, and in this node, we created those update rules for the backwards information filter, the forward marginals, but also the input and the output marginals. And then also we were able to, like in this BIFM node, store some metadata. So we put this A, B, and C matrices in there. And we could also save some intermediate values there, which were useful for, the, for computing the marginals. So that's the first part. Now, yeah, I think this is like the coolest part of the presentation where we will show how we managed to get this into Reactive MP. So I think this. Uh, because it's of course a little bit different than your regular way of performing inference because you compute the marginals in a forward pass already. So this is how we did it. Um, this is like the node pulled out. And what we just did is we started just with computing the backwards messages with this precision weight mean precision uh, parameterization. So this is not too difficult yet. So this is just some basic rules. And then when we come to the beginning, then we start to get some, some issues because now we want to sort of get the forward marginals. But that's, uh, yeah, difficult because it, like in reactive MP, you want to compute like the product of the incoming and the outcoming. So like this is our, our, our workaround. So we created this BIFM helper node at the beginning. And what this does is it first in the backwards pass just spits through this, this the same backwards message. And then here you encounter this, this, this uninformative prior here. And then you just here you do marginalization just like in a regular way, just with the product, and you get this marginal message. But now with this help, we put a mean field constraint on this node such that it's, it accepts the marginals. And then it just simply forwards this marginal through the helper node. And now here we, we have like a forwards and a backwards message, but now we have to find a custom prod function is that when you want to multiply along this edge to get the marginals, you will take the, only the marginal message and basically discard the, the backwards message uh, like this. And now here we see that we are in the ballpark of uh, BIFM, so how we can compute this. 
So we have the backwards message of C1 and the previous marginal. And now we can have all the information to compute the marginal for Z1. And then in reactive MP, when we want to marginalize this, we can say with our custom plot function, only take the, the marginal message. And from this, we can continue uh, forwards, of course. Now we can compute the margin for C2, C3, C4, etc. So that's very cool. And uh, yeah, that's how we got it to work. So a quick code snippet here, where we'll go briefly through the, through the steps. So in the first part here, we define an, uh, an informative prior, which we uh, put through this helper node with this mean field constraint for the marginals. And then at each time step, we have this BIFM node, where we first sample U here from a Gaussian, a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And then uh, we put this in a BIFM node, where you get the input, the previous hidden state, and the next hidden state, and here in this metadata, we store A, B, and C. But also, uh, as a side note, this can differ from time step to time step. So we can also have a different A, B, and C for every time step, which would also allow this to extend this, uh, this model to like time in, uh, how do you call it, uh, non-stationary uh, state-space models with a different A, B, and C for every time step, which is also a, a cool benefit. And then, uh, yeah, so what comes out is this XT here, which is this intermediate value. And then we add some, uh, some noise again. And then at the end here, we have this an informative prior with, uh, zeros, uh, with the zeros for precision weighted mean and the zeros for the precision matrix. So yeah, that's how it works in the code. And we, it actually managed to work, which I was uh, very happy about. So now let's uh, quickly Lastly, look at some uh, at some of those results when comparing the two methods now. So the first thing that we did here is that we see that um, this because you do not require an inverse in the hidden of the hidden state anymore, the numerical stability is improved. So what you see here is like a, a one as a signal, and what we did is we created an eight-dimensional hidden signal with a one-dimensional input and a one-dimensional output signal. And here you see only the first dimension of this eight dimensional hidden signal. And when the linear state space model uh, strategy of reactive MP or like the current approach is used to infer the, the hidden state, we see that it drifts off a little bit at the beginning, but also here at the end. And we think that this is because of it requires to infer this covariance matrix, which is then propagated through. And then, yeah, this gives uh, numerical st instability issues because you see it claims to be around here, but it has simply drifted off. Whereas with our BIFM node implementation, we see that the inference is just very close to the, to the, to the actual signal. But of course, not perfect because you still have some noise there. But you see that it's, it's much more close, so more numerically stable. So that was already the first gain of such a BIFM node. And we also like compared the running times. So here we have the output dimension, which we compared. So the green ones is our initial implementation of BIFM. The blue one is this BIFM node implementation. And this orange one was like the, the current approach of reactive MP, which is we call the linear state space model approach. And we see here that BIFM is just a straight line across the output, which was again, as we expected, and also as what we have had seen in the, in the beginning. But for the linear state space model, because also of this inverse, it seems to scale quite poorly with D. So yeah, perhaps unrealistic, but if you have a 20 dimensional output, then we see that uh, the, the current approach would take 200 milliseconds, whereas here it takes only like seven, seven milliseconds, which is, a, is an enormous computational gain. And lastly, we also check the hidden state dimensions. So here you can see the linear state space model for the hidden state. And we see that this inverse here again increases this, this, this jump. This is also like the plot I showed you earlier. And here we are really in the order of, of seconds. Whereas with the reactive MP with the BIFM node implementation, it scales much, much better. It even seems to scale better than, than our current uh, or our initial implementation of BIFM. Uh, but that could perhaps be because reactive MP might scale better. But uh, yeah, I'm not really sure well, why that is the case. And also here in the end, we see that it, it, it certainly jumps up for, but I unfortunately did not have an uh, explanation due to time constraints. 
But the cool thing to see is that you're in the yeah, relatively high uh, 20 to 30 range of hidden states. This BIFM implementation is around 20 milliseconds, whereas here we are already at around 700 milliseconds. So the efficiency is enormously improved and the computational gains are, are very impressive with this BIFM implementation. So yeah, that's basically um, the wrap up. So this is what we uh, did with the BIFM node. So let's wrap things up here now. So what did we do in this internship and this presentation? So we investigated these three smoothers, first from a theoretical perspective, but then also from an experimental perspective by implementing them. And we indeed saw that the theory and the practice agreed with each other and that uh, yeah, the complexities were, were as expected with the plots. Then we also implemented this BIFM node in Reactive MP, and we managed to get it to work. And then we uh, yeah, compared the current approach with the linear state space model with this BIFM node. And then we saw that this BIFM node had quite some, uh, quite some uh, improvements with numerical stability, but also it was faster for large NND as well. So we saw that this BIFM node really had some, some advantages and an edge over the current implementation for these models. So lastly, the recommendations. So what are your, so the answer to the internship uh, questions, uh, which smoother would to be used? It's probably an unsatisfying answer, but yeah, there is no one smoother fits all, unfortunately. And it's simply the best to have all three at your disposal. But luckily you can like a priori estimate which smoother you think would perform best because of those complexities you had and the plots that you saw. So you can use these values the dimensionality of your output, input, and hidden state to already say, okay, so I think that it would be better to use this or that smoother. So we saw that, for example, MBF scaled very well when your M was large, whereas the other scaled horribly for M. So there it was like, okay, if your M is large, then MBF should be the should be the best choice. And then the other way around is then for BIFM. And also something important is that the sparsity of your output or your input is uh, important. So for example, if you have a sparse output, that means that you have very few equality nodes. And equality nodes were the ones where MBF had to do an inverse. But if you have very few equality nodes, that means that MBF would have very few inverses. So then MBF would be the better choice. And of course, the other way around with input for BIFM. And also something you should take a, a note from is that extensibility because as you saw, MBF and BIFM have the drawback that you compute the marginals immediately in the second pass. So you don't really have the forward and the backwards message, which might make these more difficult to be using to extend. If you want to extend your model, say in the inputs, you add some extra, extra models on top of that. So that's also something that you should take into account. And yeah, so lastly is, uh, some future work which I would have done if I had some extra weeks with I thought some cool directions. So last would be cool to implement uh, MBF as well because we have like the proof of concept and it's very similar apart from some update rules to BIFM. So it would be cool to implement that as well. But yeah, we did not really have the time, but it would not have been that difficult. And another interesting one was the square root Gaussian message passing, which is not uh, that close to this internship, but we, look, we, we quickly looked at it. And it's very interesting. So how it works is, is that you can decompose your covariance matrix in like a Koleski decomposition, so that you have like a Koleski factor. And instead of propagating the full uh, covariance matrix, you only propagate the Koleski factor. And the cool thing about the Koleski factor is that there's like the dynamic range of, which is approximately the square root of the dynamic range of your full covariance matrix which would make this, this method more numerically stable, but then again, less easily extendable. But it would have been cool to take a look at. And also what would have been cool is to uh, yeah, investigate also the influence of sparsity on the performance of, for example, BIFM. So now all our models had a plus and an equality node at every time step. But we think that, if, for example, you would have a sparse input, so say only a plus node every 100 time steps, then BIFM would be very, would, would even be faster. So that would even be a more compelling case for BIFM. So it would have been cool to check that out as well, but we did not have the, the time for that. So yeah, that's the end of my presentation, but then again, also the end of my, uh, my internship. So I would also like to do a quick thank you for everyone.
for it was a pleasure of meeting you all and seeing your your presentations and talking to you although it might be online and yeah some quick thanks to uh, my supervisor robert for his feedback with uh, our meeting uh, dimitri for helping us out with the pifm note uh, Bert for inviting me to do this internship because it has been a real a real blast and of course especially Bart for uh, meeting with me twice a week having the time for that and uh, steering me in the right direction and helping me keeping me on track so yeah that's it thank you for listening uh, do you have any questions nice job uh, uh, Martin so any questions yeah, I have a question, Bert. Can we just upload this video on YouTube uh, and name it like, you know, comprehensive introduction to smoothing via message passing? And it was great. I mean, it's like. Yeah, yeah, this was really good. We should probably uh, post it on uh, on YouTube if you are OK with that, uh, Martin. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank um, you. Yeah. Demi. Uh, but I also have uh, another question, so. <laughs> OK, go ahead. Uh, so for your uh, like initial um, implementation for smoothing in reactive MP, can you can you go to the code uh, like not BIFM but just RTS? Uh, you mean the, the code or in the presentation? Uh, like model specification, yeah. Faster. Um, oh. Do you mean this one? Uh, I don't see your screen anymore. Oh, for screen. I okay. Uh, let me try to to fix it real quick. So yeah. you mean this one? Yeah, I think so. Here it's just like a comment, but uh, so here you use like a plus node to add some noise to your observations. But uh, in principle, it's like a little bit inefficient because it's equivalent if you just will create a MV normal in precision node without like zeros, but you just plug in C times Z Y. So oh, you just yeah. you just kind of create this extra plus node, and this extra plus node may always uh, it may also include some extra inverses. So it's unnecessary in some sense. So you can just okay. plug instead of zeros, you can just plug uh, this multiplication in address. It oh, will be it will make it a little bit more efficient. And I saw that for by BIFM, you actually did that. You, okay. you you didn't use this plus node for observation noise. Okay, that's a small. That's a good thing. It might be a small oversight. So yeah. So I think you mean putting the C times CI here, right? Yeah, I don't think that it actually like influenced results uh, like uh, uh, a, a lot, but it it for sure it added some uh, a little bit of or like extra latency yeah. to benchmarks. I think that's a good point. I think we did it indeed in the beginning the way you said, but this was to make like stay true to the model here. So this plus node was mo mostly just to make sure that it's like equivalent to the model. Mm -hmm. But yes, you're right. I think this this is unnecessary. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good point. Sammy. Yes. Uh, uh, well done, Martin. Yeah, it was a really really good uh, presentation. I liked it. Uh, could you please go to uh, slide 34? Yeah. OK, my question uh, is about especially the first graph. Maybe Dimitri m might want to involve in this discussion because yeah, it seems that there is like a, a lot of discrepancy between the estimations, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, the regular implementation with reactive message passing. And you claim that this is because of numerical instability, but I'm quite skeptical about it. So now I'm wondering, can it be because of the reactive uh, nature of these uh, reactive mass specific. What I mean is basically, for example, in Forna Lab, during the inference, we first create this uh, inference schedule, right? And this message passing schedule is quite important in the yeah in the performance of uh, Bayesian inference. And in reactive message passing, there is no such a such a uh, scheduler. And for your implementation, you basically built this helper node. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, maybe this helper node kind of imposes some some kind of uh, scheduler in yeah. the inference, which makes uh, the estimations way better than the regular reactive message passing implementation. So yeah. 
I mean, are you sure about that the reason for the discrepancy in the first estimation is because of numerical instability? Uh, that's a very good question. In honesty, it would be even better to put this as an hypothesis because it's indeed uh, the, the underlying things of the active MP are, are beyond me. But I noticed uh, that the larger N got, the larger the discrepancies got. So for example, when I did N is 20, we even got to E to the to the 23 or something like that. But those were like not nice to look at plots because it was just straight line from blue and then red went at some jumps. So from that, I perhaps jumped to the conclusion indeed that it was the inverse. But it could indeed very well be that it's something else. So uh, I, I can add something. So uh, yeah, I don't agree with you saying that schedule matters in this case because it's some product. So I mean, for VMP, of course, schedule matters, but it's some product. So I don't think that like the order you compute messages matters in this case. But this case is also kind of suspicious. So when I saw this plot, I thought that maybe it's better to check current rules. So I think the math is completely the same as in formula. So we just basically we copy pasted these rules, right? And it, it's it's kind of confusing behavior. I also don't see any immediate explanation for that. Maybe we just should check this out. But I don't think that it has to do something with schedule uh, or like, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I, true, true. I mean, I, here's the thing. I don't know the details of reactive message passing implementation. So yeah, it's just it was just a, a kind of hypothesis. But um, I, I just want to raise my uh, concern here that I'm really skeptical uh, if this is because of numerical instability. I mean, this. Uh, I agree. I also noticed that strange, but I, 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 I personally, I want to check this out because it's super strange. OK, cool, cool. Maybe maybe it might be a good idea to also compare it with uh, f like the current version of Fornilab, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that that's strange. I agree. It's uh, like a good question, good note. Okay. Yeah, and for Semi, indeed, so we locked like the, the pipeline stage of the PIFM node. And indeed, so it first does the full backwards pass because it has to wait for this helper node to be, to, to be done. So when you indeed it kind of imposes this this ordering that you first do the full backwards pass and then do the full forward pass, the PIFM nodes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bart. Yeah, hey Martin. Uh, so thanks a lot for the presentation. It was uh, it was really nice. Uh, so I have one quick question because we now have this PIFM node that we can use in Fornilab and we create this smoother. Mm -hmm. um, how could we like extend upon this smoother? So, for example, create an input which also depends on another common filter. Um, do you have any idea on how we can do that? Because they are likely to accept messages and not marginal messages. Yeah, so that's indeed a good a good one. So luckily, uh, we have the the answer. So we are able to compute this input and output marginals. So. Although it's difficult to compute, uh, like uh, let's see what's the best picture for that. this will this this will do. So like you cannot really explicitly compute this outgoing message here, but you can compute the marginal and the incoming message. So if your input is low dimensional, then from that with some workarounds, you can indeed compute also the outgoing uh, the outgoing message here. So I think that's what might be one way to extend upon this. OK, thanks a lot. One, one last thing from me. Mm -hmm. uh, this is more like a suggestion rather than a question because. Uh, so, so you may it's, it's just you may want to show these up upward messages as well in your uh, figures. For example, if you go uh, to the slide before, maybe it is a. Uh, yeah, RTS, about the RTS. Could you please yeah. go there? I think it's somewhere. Yeah, yeah. By the way, no, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing a kind of noise. OK, yeah, it's, it's, it's good now. It came yeah. from Albert. Maybe you can check out your uh, microphone, Albert. OK. I don't think it's from me. OK. Yeah, anyway. Uh, so, for example, here during this uh, forward, like this, is basically like filtering. So you 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 show these messages going right, 
and uh, you might you might want to show the messages going up as well because uh, this is going to make it even more clear to one who is not very familiar with smoothing and filtering because right now what you are doing during this RTS so first of all you you basically like uh yeah perform this filtering and you take this uh, message from observation but in the in the smoothing you do not take this message upward right you just calculate these uh, left messages and for for the other ones i guess especially the last one i sorry i forgot the abbreviation for the last one but yeah, for the one, you first do this right i mean you first calculate the left message and you also take the uh, collect the messages from the observations but for the messages going right, you basically do not take these forward messages, uh, sorry, upward messages, right? Yeah. That's a good point indeed. So in, in fact, in we here, we use this upward message here as well, this one as well, but that's yeah. not, yeah. so I should have added that indeed. Just a, just a suggestion. Yeah, yeah, no, those, making those messages and those in the correct notation and making them fit in the picture was, was difficult. So I think adding here another one and there another one is indeed the, the correct way to go, but it might confuse people yeah. as well. But you guys are familiar with this, so that should have been possible. But thanks for the suggestion. Sure. Um, Kain? Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Martin. Thanks for the uh, great presentation and the great results. Uh, it was very impressive. Um, I have a, just a question from uh, out of curiosity. The, we saw some some uh, huge difference, some spikes in computation time for the different dimensions in the in the matrices. There's also a question that you posed, I, I believe, a few weeks ago, uh, and it turns out to be some very rude uh, Julia thing. But uh, do you do you know uh, actually what what it's really uh, happening there, what Julia is doing over there, and have you any idea how that influenced the uh, the comparison in, in what scale or so? Yeah, so that's indeed a very good question. So it would have been much nicer for the results if this was just a straight line. Mm. But yeah, this spike first was like, how on earth does this happen? And yeah, we, we first thought that it was something with the implementation, but then just doing a regular inverse in a clean Julia environment use the same results for different versions, even different users on the Julia Slack channel were all confused. So yeah, we tried to look at it. It uh, was like some things you can really look under the hood. I don't know, it was uh, something like some ad statement and you could see something, but yeah, it was, we did not really spend more than a couple of days mm. in it because we thought, yeah, it's not like we are going to fix uh, such a root Julia issue here. So we just have to we have to live with it. But yeah, it's a very quirky thing. And yeah, it's an unfortunate, uh, but yeah, it's unfortunately something we had to deal with. So we looked into it and tried some different, like use some back solvers or other ways, but all had the same issue. Uh, yeah, I see that's unfortunate. Would be, would have been idealistic if you would have solved that and uh, that's really, really yeah. rude Julia thing. But uh, I was just curious where it's, uh, if you ever found out where it came from, but thanks for this, uh, Martin. Yeah. Fortunately not, but it would have been cool, yeah. but it's a, it's a good question. All right, let's do final question then. Um, Albert? Uh, yeah, it's uh, be an easy one. Uh, Martin, first of all, thanks a lot uh, for the presentation. It's quite impressive work uh, has been done in uh, three months or so. Um, yeah, well, uh, the question is like, when you compare these algorithms, so I, I imagine that you've uh, you were committed to a certain uh, parameterization for all of this uh, for all these algorithms. So you've been using like I don't know, um, yeah, Gaussian uh, mean precision or whatsoever. So I, I'm curious. So first of all, what what did you use? Uh, which parameterization and how do, does parameterization actually influences the the performance of all these algorithms. So I, I, I can imagine if you use this Gaussian weighted mean precision, maybe the difference will not be that huge, but just uh, my guess it might be uh, not right. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, yeah, maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, that's a good question. So for these initial implementations, we just, uh, yeah, we just did the parameterizations which were uh, like given here on the, on the slides. So 
We're just following the update rules from the from the thesis and adapting them a little bit. And then indeed yeah, for the end with reactive MP, you can really choose your, your parameterization. So like for I think this one, yeah, we tried uh, like all the different possibilities. So we also tried you with a mean covariance and the other one with the mean covariance, but that did not influence this linear state space model implementation. So we took some time to make sure we, we really had the best implementation of reactive MP to make to have a fair comparison. But there were no really significant differences here yet. And for the first three, we just basically stick to the to the parameterization, I think, like these ones. We just stick to these parameterizations. Just mainly because the advertising here, because these are the ones that are easy to the plus nodes. Uh, okay, but uh, I'm, I'm curious if in uh, reactive MP, I've never actually is specified any of my random variables as a Gaussian weighted mean precision, but is it uh, possible to do, to have this? Okay, okay, then, uh, okay, then uh, thanks, uh, Martin, for the, for the answer. But, but this is, this is, yeah, I, I, I agree with Albert, like, uh, this weight mean, weight mean precision parameterization for Gaussian distribution basically refers to natural parameters of Gaussian distribution, and this product right. Prod, prod function then like the you know like collision of the messages turns out to be just summation of natural parameters during this posterior calculation so this may help you to get rid of many of the inversions this kind of stuff and uh, may speed up your influence so you may want to be careful about the yeah parameterization of the distributions mm -hmm. yeah that's a fair point uh, i can add uh, here as well so i agree with you guys so it's like really important but there is an issue here with like multiplication node because multiplication node uh, it always works in the mean covariance parameterization and it inevitably, inevitably changes and so your product will probably always be interesting i mean there is like an issue if, as i understand the IFM, the ifm node it does multiplication inside so there is no such issue. But you mean the multiplication uh, when you multiply with the matrix? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean multiplication of the matrix, and then when you do product uh, to computer marginals, right? You after multiplication, you have this uh, mean covariance parameterization, and yeah, weighted mean precision somewhere else. I think not necessarily, no, I, but we can uh, just talk about it later. I mean, I mean, I agree with you, but I mean, it's still hard to maintain this, uh, you know, weighted mean precision everywhere in the model. It's like, uh, but it, it's better, of course, to use weighted mean precision because yeah, it's just summation of the natural parameters. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, then let's uh, give another round of applause to Martin and thank him. Uh, Martin, for your uh, for your presence over the past three months it was really fun to have you. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't seen each other much in uh, in in real life. But uh, um, so when Corona lifts, just uh, come back and uh, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's talk again. Um, yeah, so then I think we can close the the meeting for now, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'll be at the drink definitely, so uh, you won't get rid of me now. Of course, I cannot miss <laughs> such an opportunity. I will extend the contract for two weeks. And then, uh, okay, good. Yeah, come to, and come to the social stuff, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm more the social. Uh, I, I, I come to all the socials and then uh, that's it. Yeah, that's Super. Good. Super. Okay. All right, then. All right, I'll stop the recording. Yes. Yeah.